morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to Global STS2 Decolonial Praxis in STS, hosted by the STS Futures Initiative, a graduate student-led virtual series of professional development workshops and events tailored to students in the field of science and technology studies. STS Futures Initiative is generously funded by the University of California Humanities Research Institute. Last year, we hosted panels on book publishing, op-ed writing, and the digital humanities. And we also hosted the Cal STS retreat after UC Davis kindly uh, gave us the go ahead to run the online programming. We're joined by two STS Futures core members, Elizabeth Hargret, who's a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, and R. Baker, PhD candidate at UC Santa Barbara. I'm Kat Gutierrez, Assistant Professor of Southeast Asian and Philippine History at UC Santa Cruz. Thank you all for being here to launch STS Futures Fall 2021 programming. We have upcoming workshops on podcast development and STS and activism. So please be on the lookout through our Twitter page and website. And Baker is going to drop that information in the chat. Now I'm going to hand it over to my co-organizer, Jamie Morse. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Jamie Morse. I'm an assistant professor in sociology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I'm affiliated with the Science and Justice Research Center here. Um, Kat and I are both on faculty at UC Santa Cruz and we'd like to provide a land acknowledgement. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe, the Amamutsin tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the central coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. Thanks, Jamie. Global STS2 uh, pick today grow, picks up from our discussion last spring, Global STS1, Transnational Network Building, Asia, Oceania, and Beyond, that featured STS scholars actively building transnational networks while confronting the entrenched politics and problems inherent in what has been an Anglo-European dominant school of thought. Our panelists provided their approaches to open source publishing, their insight into nation specific STS traditions, and even the possibility of durian as method. Um, I'm still all about this, so check out the recorded conversation if you're curious about what that is. Jamie and I arrived to the theme decolonial praxis in STS because we see it tied to the question of what constitutes the global transnational or even spatial turn in STS. And as Kat and I began discussing what it might mean to curate workshops on what some have called the global turn, at that time I was putting together a new graduate seminar on global and transnational perspectives in STS here at UC Santa Cruz. I was grappling with how to respond to the recent calls to decolonize the curriculum in my course design and pedagogy. One of the reasons we decided to hold two panels, this two-part series, is that our work had pointed to at least two related but distinct ways of responding to these calls. The first was attending to the formation of new regional and transnational networks that were expanding scholarship in STS and working to institutionalize the field beyond its historical centers in North America and Western Europe. And at the same time, we were finding that through our encounters with some of this work and some of these networks, that unfortunately, there was often this continuing dominance of Euro-American scholars and Euro-American scholarship, even within these efforts that were explicitly designed to open dialogue and space for new perspectives and new ways of engaging with STS. So we decided to curate a two-part series. Yeah, so you know we continually grapple with questions like, what neocolonial logics are we up against? What kinds of Anglo-European epistemic authority are we reiterating or re-inhabiting in this work? And decolonial and the calls for decolonization, not only in our field, but across our disciplines and institutions, make our concerns a lot more palpable. At the same time, demands to decolonize aren't new, especially when we think of activist communities, indigenous rights and third world movements, and a genealogy of scholars who had been positioning decolonial methods and research practices before the word entered into the academic mainstream. And so we wanna be mindful as we begin this conversation that this emergent area of research and theorizing that is becoming called decolonial STS which I wanna note did appear as a thematic category in our recent 4S conference that 
uh, Dr. Talbert co-organized. Um, it builds on prior work that may not have used this terminology explicitly, but nonetheless advocated for anti-colonial and anti-racist approaches to the study of science, technology, and medicine, including indigenous STS, post-colonial STS, feminist STS, and critical race STS. So what do we mean by decolonial practices in STS? That's sort of the question we wanna begin with here today. There's many possible ways of approaching this question. And just to sort of start us out and provide an initial framing, um, there's some kind of different ways that Kat and I have thought about it. So one would be kind of undertaking the careful, very fine-grained study empirical study of the entanglements of science, medicine, and empire and their legacies today. And we can also think about attending to our own methods and our own practices of knowledge production, what we study and how we study it, as well as how we engage in theorizing and which literatures that we put ourselves in conversation with. So for example, to what extent do we include but also go beyond your American scholarship? And finally, in all of this, how can we attend to the colonial legacies of institutions of higher education themselves, both in terms of histories of gate gatekeeping and exclusionary practices, but also in terms of the persistent power imbalances between different regions, between the so-called global north and the global south. We also approach this matter with students in mind. So for instance, how can decolonial praxis be part of students' considerations when, as they engage in STS work, how might they re-envision their projects and what are the historical and contemporary limitations of decolonial as a modifier when the very work we accomplish may be performed on unceded lands and when the very diasporic or displaced position we might embody emerged historically from a colonial encounter. So today we'd like to explore with our audience and our panelists how we might think about decolonial praxis in STS, what it might mean, and how we, might we approach this question in our work and our scholarship. And today we have the great privilege of hearing from leaders in STS who are approaching these questions from a variety of perspectives. We have folks who are creating new regional networks, exploring open access data and publishing venues to support scholars in the global south, and facilitating research and theorizing in emerging subfields of STS that include, but importantly, go beyond Euro-American scholarship and canon making in STS. We also have folks who are unsettling the practice of science itself. So a huge thank you to our panelists and to everyone for being a part of this conversation today. We are so delighted to have you. Cool. So by way of introductions, I have the honor of introducing Drs. Talbert, Kalapenik, and Rodriguez Medina. Kim Talbert is a Sisseton Wapaton Oyate scholar and is professor and Canada research chair in indigenous peoples, technoscience and society, faculty of native studies at the University of Alberta. She is the author of Native American DNA, Tribal Belonging and the False Promise of Genetic Science through the University of Minnesota Press and is co-founder of the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics or SING Canada. You can follow her research group at indigenoussts.com. Baker, maybe you could put that in the chat. Jessica Kalapenik is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. With Dr. Talbert, she is a co-founder of the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics, Canada, as well as the co-lead of the Indigenous Science, Technology, and Society Research and Training Program, Indigenous STS. She is Cree from Paigua's First Nation. Finally, we also have Dr. Leandro Rodriguez Medina, who is professor in the Department of International Relations and Political Science at the Universidad de las Americas, Puebla. He is a member of the National System of Researchers of the Mexican Council for Science and Technology and the founding editor-in-chief of Tapuya, Latin American Science, Technology, and Society. And in very exciting news, he will chair the 2022 4S and Latin American Association of the Social Studies of Science and Technologies joint meeting in Puebla, Mexico. And I have the honor of introducing uh, Dr. Richard Rottenberg, who's a professor of science and technology studies at the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research, known as WISER, at the University of the Wits Waters Rand in Johannesburg, South Africa. He is working with and from WISER to build a continent-wide focus on science and technology studies in Africa. He is the author of Far-Fetched Facts and editor of The World of Indicators. 
Dugu Kastogan is Assistant Professor of Urbanization and Environmental Problems in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at Izmir Kaptik Chalibi University in Turkey. She's the founding member of Istanbul Lab and the Transnational STS Network. She is also council member of the Society for Social Studies of Science, or S, since September 2019, and is an associate editor for the open access journal, Engaging Science, Technology, and Society. Her research focuses on democratization of science, transnational collaborations, political ecology of disasters, toxicity governance, and bioeconomies. Angela Okune is completing her doctorate in anthropology at the University of California, Irvine in December, and will join a nonprofit called Code for Science and Society from 2022. Working together with Dugu and a broader editorial collective, she is also an associate editor for the new open access journal, Engaging Science, Technology, and Society, where she supports contributors to experiment with new genres and careful sharing of ethnographic data objects towards scholarly community building. Building on 10 years of work in Nairobi's tech research se sector, Angela co-founded and maintains an experimental open ethnographic data portal called Research Data Share that leverages the open source platform for experimental collaborative ethnography, also known as PEACE, to hold space for thinking about what post-colonial objectivity in Kenya is and could be. And she works together with Dr. Wamunyu on this initiative. She is also a member of the Forest Council and leads initiatives to infrastructure for more transnational and transgenerational relations among STS researchers, including through a sketch-centered virtual workshop for student members of the 4S Society. Dr. Wambui Wamunyu is a Kenyan-based journalism researcher and member of a multidisciplinary research collective. Her recent projects include a book chapter on internet development in Kenya and a contribution to the Visualizing the Virus Project, which showcases COVID-19's diverse global manifestations. So thank you again to all of our panelists for being here today. So for today's panel, uh, so we've prepared questions that we're gonna ask specific panelists. Even if we direct a question at a panelist or a set of panelists, um, we actually encourage everyone to feel free to share your burning insight if you like. For those in the audience, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and our fearless chat jockey Baker will collect them for our 10 minute audience Q&A at the end. And so we know that about 70 minutes or so is not enough. We have a big panel with excellent thinkers. And so even having everyone in the same room is pretty incredible. We encourage everyone to please check out these scholars publications, blog posts, recorded lectures, open source journals, online journals, and to please reach them to continue the conversation if you didn't quite get everything you wanted today. All right, Jamie, so I'm gonna hand it off to you to start us off. Thanks, Kat. So we'd like to first open the floor with a question for Dr. Kim Talbear. As one of the leaders in indigenous STS, what are your thoughts on these current calls for decolonial STS? How should we think about them and how might we respond? Oh, I didn't expect that question. <laughs> I thought they were, I was looking at the, so can you say that again? What are, what are my perceptions of current calls for decolonial STS? That was, yeah, that was the question, but if yeah. you want to speak to the one that you uh, prepared for, that's absolutely perfect as well. Well, I mean, we don't really use the term decolonial STS as much in um, our indigenous STS work. So, you know, and in, and in helping organize uh, for us this year, although I do not want to overstate my uh, organizational contributions or capacities because they are very small, <laughs> I basically worked on the plenaries that I worked on. Um, I was much more focused on teasing out what's indigenous STS, which can sit within a broader framework of thinking about decolonization, right? Because not all colonized peoples are or should identify as indigenous, but that's a whole other, <laughs> that, so, so a lot of what I think about, and I, I work this answer into other um, questions, but that's fine. A lot of what I think about really goes back to basics. And um, so this may not be in conversation with your terminology and the terminology maybe of some of the other panelists I'm excited to hear, but I'm really thinking about the basics are the repatriation for us of indigenous land and life. And we can talk about the repatriation of 
land and life to other colonized peoples as well. We need to return wealth. Uh, land and life to me means wealth. And that's a very compromised English language word. We can, it would be best to dig into indigenous languages and worldviews to talk about these things, but that's not the world that we live in. So what are we, what are we giving back? What kinds of resources is it possible? Resources is another terrible, terrible world to, to restore to colonized peoples in order to build their own institutions, languages, worldviews, and their own forms of research and inquiry. Because uh, whether it's science and technological inquiry or whether it's STS itself, it's not only the sciences that are implicated in this, it's the social sciences and humanities as well. These knowledges have been built on the backs of, col of colonized peoples with their resources and land. And so this isn't about inclusion, this is about returning. And so anyway, that's what I think. And I don't know if that's an answer to that question, but it's what I wanted to say. <laughs> uh, it definitely is an answer to the question, I think so. Um, and so, you know, you reference Indigenous studies and, you know, I think this also kind of speaks to different intellectual currents in STS. And so I want to actually pitch this question now to Jessica, Leandro and Richard, you know, for you to just also talk about you know, your work in these other intellectual currents in STS. Um, whether they're indigenous STS or sort of more geograph geographically defined, you know, kind of fields of STS and how then your subfields um, are kind of responding to the call for decolonization or again, decolonial as a word. Jessica, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting question for me. Uh, indigenous STS, as, as I've written about, um, is not a subfield of STS. It is a subfield of critical Indigenous studies, which is a completely different genealogy. So my co-thinkers and teachers are not Jasanoff and Haraway and Latour. They're Morton Robinson, Tall Bear, um, Anderson, um, my mom, my grandmother, the land where I come from. Um, it, it's it's a very different disciplinary background, and and it's it's actually. Um, the way I see Indigenous STS is more of a placeholder, an institutional placeholder, not for growing a new subfield uh, that yet again builds up the institutional capacities of, of colonial spaces and, and white institutions, but really it's, it's, it's a placeholder for us to do the work of supporting Indigenous communities and capacities. Um, so that's sort of my initial kind of thoughts on, on, on Indigenous STS and how that, how we fit into to this conversation. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Leandro, how about you? Yeah, um, uh, I, I don't use the Indigenous uh, word very much uh, in my own research. Uh, Indigenous as a translation into Spanish is a complicated word. Uh, especially when you use it in English, because sometimes indigenous is local, actually, uh, local in Spanish. So um, I, what I'm saying now is that I'm not, uh, I'm not doing research. I have not done research on indigenous in terms of indigenous people here in Latin America, uh, but I'm interested in, uh, in, in the way that uh, Professor Tolbert um, frame the issue of repatriation, because I think uh, that for academics, even for academics, which is my main concern uh, as an editor of a journal and interested in academic practices, uh, academics in the periphery need that kind of, you know, return process. So I, I started to uh, reflect on decentralization as a, as a way to understand how uh, the power concentrating some centers should be decentralized uh, through infrastructure that helps to um, create more plurality, more voices, but under their own conditions of knowledge production, not just inviting them to join the mainstream association, conferences, journals, whatever. So I, I, I'm, I'm very much interested in uh, this process and how we, from the periphery, can contribute not only to give some sort of ethical or political goal, final goal, but more in terms of what kind of, of uh, infrastructure we can contribute to create uh, and what kind of bridges we, we can contribute to create with all uh, academics in the North who are interested in 
losing power, which is a very weird way of putting this probably, but if you are not willing to lose in some power, well, maybe the dialogue is almost impossible from the very beginning. Right on. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, Richard, how about you? Yes, um, I can say a few things. Uh, um, my, my take on what I understand to uh, decolonial practice to be, and uh, luckily it is different from all the things that have been said until now. Maybe I'm speaking from the space in between uh, the global North and, and African situations. And, and, and I have a few points. One is once decoupled from other societal fields, uh, modern science and technology as we know them are in themselves deeply colonizing endeavors. In this sense, the colonial practice is about ways of how to prevent one societal field to colonize another one. For instance, the, the current debate about genome editing and its relation to ethics. And in, in my conversations with Sheila Jasanov uh, and under her leadership and, and, and her attempt to open a, an observatory on genome editing, the point is, the, the way we know modern science, it first uh, develops a, a technical procedure, and then afterwards the question is being raised, what are the ethics of it, and what, what is the use of it for humanity? And, and the, the quest is how to turn the sequence around, and first define that question, and then see what can technically be done. So this is a specific form of colonization, and it works analogous to another one which is better known to us, namely how the market works. It's a, a mechanism that absorbs or colonizes other fields. For instance, when work becomes labor or housing, health, health service, education becomes a commodity, then these fields are being colonized by the logic of the market. Now, in practice, the technoscience and the economic col uh, colonization, they process, they, they join forces and result in a seemingly unstoppable alliance that even democracy could not uh, prevent. And that is capitalist technoscience uh, uh, develops an equipment that transforms nature into a resource for unequally distributed wells. So one way to understand decolonial practices how to address this dimension. And up to this point, it has nothing to do with the word colonization as it is generally used in everyday language. So that, that is the second point. Techno-scientific capitalism does not only tend to colonize all societal fields, but also it tends to grow and expand and in include more and more spaces and people around the world. The European colonization of large parts of the world during the 500 years, roughly between 1450 and 1950, was an expression of this. Now, in relation to this second point, decolonization, decolonial practice needs to address this toxic history and its innumerable, innumerable crimes against humanity. And, oh. and now my, my point is, which I maybe can develop later when uh, other uh, contributions were made is I assert that any attempt to deal separately with these two different forms of colonization is bound to fail. This is because they are inherently linked to each other. Attempts to deal separately with the one or the other form of colonization will also fail because those 500 years have radically changed the world and even the planet in all regards. This implies many things, but mainly th three are important. And I, I, I think I will come to, th to them later when, when I have another chance. So uh, at this moment, I want to say these two forms of colonization can only be seriously and successfully dealt with together. And then maybe I can say more later. Thank you, Richard. Um, before I move on to the next question, I just wanted to allow space if anyone would like to respond to anything that's been said or offer 
their own thoughts on that question. Okay, please do feel free to jump in. We don't want to be, you know, we don't want the questions to become a way of, of not allowing for full participation. So please. We do actually have free. one um, anonymous uh, question and this is for Professor Tallbear. Um, and the question is, how do you conceptualize the use of repatriation versus rematriation? And which term would you suggest we use when discussing the necessity of land back? I actually never use the word rematriation. It's not a word that we use in my community or in any of the genealogies I come from. Uh, as I encounter it, um, and which I don't encounter it that much, I'll certainly ask questions about uh, what it means, but it's not a word I use. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I come from not an official matriarchal culture, but an unofficial one because of the politics of the, the different ways in which gender figures into colonial violence and colonial impositions. So uh, I'm open to the idea, but I, yeah, I don't think it's, I think it's um, a bit more specific than repatriation and it, yeah. I have evolving thoughts on it. Sorry, that's my answer. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you. So the next question is for Dugu and Angela. Um, what have been the challenges of trying to build a regional or transnational network while committing to a decolonial STS or other formations as you've, as you've been involved in them? Maybe we can start with Dugu. Okay, thank you, Jamie. I think it's a very big question because we have come across many challenges in our journey, journey during the last five years. Like it has been five years we launched Istanbul Lab. And I may just bring one to the fore uh, and that still haunts me. And this will also like, it's also related to the uh, concerns that we have discussed so far. Uh, it was about finding ways to claim for local knowledges in relation to the geographical indicators in Turkey. Uh, from the very beginning, we have been so careful not to locate Istanbul Lab as a representative point for, let's say, Turkish STS or STS in Turkey. And we had an intense discussion, for example, how to name our uh, initiative and came up with Istanbul Lab by basically stepping from the fact that this initiative was established in Istanbul initially, okay? So it has been a real challenge because um, it has been all about the mainstream connotations of local or national in Turkey uh, that uh, we call Yali ve Milli. Yali means local or homemade and Milli means national. And this has become a new imaginary in Turkey, especially following the July 15 coup attempt in 2016 at the time when we established Istanbul Lab, and it was the time when I returned back from Toronto to Turkey. And this national emphasis on local and national has been heavily instrumentalized here, here and used as a weapon against the so-called both internal and external enemies of the authoritarian regime. So this has been a paranoid and two-faced war, war, I would call it in this way, and to speak about the academic environment, for example, while the publications in English and international connections are praised in one setting, may easily slip into the points of accusations for you at a moment when you are critical of the regime. So in relation to this in Turkey, we have been also witnessing the decay of institutions such as universities and the authoritarian sorry, academic environment. So we have been walking on a very subtle line for a long time on which we have, been, we have to be critical of science at the same time advocating for science in such a really politically heavy environment. So there are lots to unpack here and I'll be happy to you know, unpack in time, but I can say in short that it has been a big challenge to walk the talk about decolonial commitments not only because of the oppressive environment here, but also given that STS is a really newly emerging field in Turkey, it has yet to be institutionalized. So it feels like trying to find pathways to the meaningful STS 
and move forward by living visible traces. And this is a challenge that asks to be okay with losing one's role constantly and continue to move with dedication in the face of frustrations and oppressions. So it may just give you a very, you know, a dark picture here, but it has been like doing SPS itself has been the, one of the biggest challenges in Turkey in such a political environment. So I couldn't, for example, claim, claim for Turkish SPS. So because I, I'm so aware of the, you know, ongoing colonial practices of the Turkish government, let's say in Africa right now. So um, this is a really double bind for me and I still continue on these issues and this still haunts me. Thank you. Thank you, Dugu. Um, Angela? Sure, and my response maybe takes a more practical approach to the question of the challenges. I think um, across the kind of various projects that I'm involved with, including the kind of student um, group within the, the 4S Council, um, ESTS, and also uh, the Research Data Share project, um, I think time and the, or the lack thereof really seems to resonate um, with everyone. And I think that's, that's part of the kind of growing commercialization of knowledge and, and academic and intellectual inquiry. Um, you know, that really feels like there isn't enough time to just spend with each other in kind of open-ended curiosity and, and open-ended questioning. Um, the, forceful kind of uh, push towards outputs, um, and especially outputs that count, outputs that matter, whether for tenure, whether for graduation, whatever it is, um, really drives a lot of a lot of the concerns. And so I think that um, that really has been one of the challenges and the undervaluing of the kind of network building and community building and the importance of building those relations. Um, you know, often they don't they don't count in the sense that matters. Um, to the university structures or, or what have you. Um, and just to kind of pull out some a concept that Jessica mentioned that really resonated with me was the idea of a placeholder. Um, and, and so in how we've been thinking about many of the digital work um, and infrastructuring that, that I've been doing with my collaborators, it really is to set up placeholders, digital placeholders in a sense, for the work that needs to be done, for the building of these relationships and collaborations. Um, and so that really resonated with me. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Angela. Um, and thank you, Dugu. I, you know, I'm going to keep us on kind of this tip around practice, praxis. You know, that was kind of the title of this panel. And I think we're also all pointing now to just how flimsy perhaps the word decolonial is and perhaps a bit too lofty and it's too early to say and it's actually too ongoing I think historically for us to really the colonial elements of, of our even our own work really to to maybe use the term and deploy it um, but kind of keeping in line for practice you know I know some of you also work in open access data sharing in publishing um, so I'm going to kind of look at you Wambui and to Leandro but if you can talk a little bit about that work and how you also see it figuring into whether, you know, it's kind of this decentralization, um, Leandro, like you said, or if, again, if decolonial is even something that you can apply. Wamba, we, we can start with you. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm trying to think where to start because I have so many things in my head. And I, I just, if, if I may come back to your question, I'd like to first acknowledge um, something that Angela said about the, the research data share, which is a collective that we are in, that um, the previous question asked about challenges, but um, I want to talk about COVID-19 as a challenge that helped us in a sense. Uh, we know what COVID was and what it did, but ironically, I think COVID also helped us get together because we couldn't travel so we could only meet online. And that way, the connections made, the people that are in that collective, half of whom I didn't know before, um, came because of, of that. So I, I, I think the idea of um, decolonizing, decentralizing, breaking barriers sometimes comes from the unexpected, the strange, you know, the, 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 the problem, um, so to speak. Um, but if I can just speak very broadly about STS first, um, because I'm fascinated already by the idea that there are strands of STS. 
um, like the indigenous SDS, uh, the, uh, the, the decolonized, you know, SDS or whatever the groups are, because this is a fairly young and new field. In fact, I, I consider myself a media studies scholar who, you know, kind of hangs around the SDS people, uh, so to speak. Um, but the idea that you can come as you are, so to speak, you know, from wherever you are from. And you can, um, I, I come from a post-colonial society where the structures, the institutions are essentially an inheritance from the colonial authorities that were there. So nothing has changed at philosophical level, at superficial level, everything has changed. But at the substantial structural and philosophical levels, we are still doing the same thing. So the idea that we can come and talk about, let's change the curriculum, let's change how we do research, let's include other people in the research process. And I speak this as someone who is considered one from the so-called global south. And the global south versus the global north, there's just this huge divide where some of us are not part of the conversation. Uh, we are on the fringes, we are the outliers, we are on the periphery, we are the marginalized, so to speak. And this new conversation says, no, we belong at the table, we have something to contribute, you're not getting a favor. This is, we, with our knowledges, with our modes of production, um, which have been excluded, by the way, even in scholarship. And even in the, the structures that we learn in, in the academy, where uh, even grounded theory is really something that people do not do. You're kind of encouraged to stay within the established lines, uh, the normal science, if I can quote Thomas Kuhn. And you're not encouraged really by the system to explore and to be different and to say, no, I can theorize from where I am. I don't have to borrow from somewhere else. So I think my um, thinking about uh, decolonizing praxis, decolonizing the curriculum, decentralizing actually is a big part of decolonizing, where you move away from what has always been the center and you move away to other places and you find new centers there and new knowledges and you acknowledge and respect those uh, knowledges. So that's what I would say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Wamboy. Um, Leandro, um, similar question, right? and I can kind of ask a version of it again, but if you can also talk a little bit about kind of decolonial practice, if the term or decentering practice works better for you, um, with regard to like tapuya, for instance. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, probably this is a panel that has made me think more, more stuff in 15 minutes that's, uh, than any other panel in <laughs> probably the last 10 years. Um, I, 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 first of all, I want to, to recognize that I, I feel in a difficult position here because I think that for an academic who has a job in, 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 in a university in Latin America, problems like the repatriation of land is, is at a different level. I mean, I, I totally, I, I feel like I'm talking about stupid things compared with other topics. Maybe I'm talking about stupid things. So that's that's my first my first concern. Whether whether we have a kind of hierarchy of the decolonizing project, if we take all of this as a huge decolonizing project that goes from very simple things related to you know perhaps the categories we use to think of ourselves and new journals or or new curricula, and then all the way to you know, repatriation or returning to the land to original uh, owners and so on. So let, let me mention that first, uh, because uh, it makes me think that the, the word decolonizing, decolonization um, can be used in my case only as a metaphor, not as a, as a full process, uh, because I'm, con I'm related to a journal that is trying uh, to create a, some conditions for, in this case, Latin American and other Southern scholars to think about themselves, about their societies, about their problems, about their uh, concerns, without 
necess the necessity to pay attention to whatever is written and whatever is said in the north. Uh, but on the other hand, for many reasons, and I don't want to use time to talk about Tapuya as a platform, but for many reasons, we are, we are interested in creating the dialogue with the North. I think it's not just uh, a space to talk um, just for us, uh, just for our ideas. It's, it's, it's creating a platform for something that I'm not sure what is at the end of the day. I'm not sure what will happen here. I, I'm, I'm sure that if we don't have these spaces, and this we refers to peripheral scholars in general, if we don't have these spaces, we won't be able to have the opportunity to think uh, and, to, and to communicate some ideas. But even if we have these spaces, we still have a, a problem that was mentioned by, by uh, the previous, uh, uh, inter in, the, in the previous intervention, which is, uh, what we are thinking about and, and what ideas are we bringing about. And I think that in that regard, the problem with infrastructure, in my view, is that once you create a space, we, we cannot guarantee that there will be a critical position on that. I can't guarantee that everything published in Tapuya or in Catalyst is critical in terms of, you know, the final political project. I'm interested in the space as such, perhaps because I'm coming from countries, I'm, I, I have lived in Mexico for 17 years, but I'm from Argentina. So in countries where fragmentation is growing and it was very strong during the 20th century, uh, the lack of opportunities to talk during dictatorships and other uh, military regimes were, was strong. So I, I really feel the need for this space of contact with, uh, with the North. Sometimes they seem to be enem enemies, but uh, in general, I think that uh, we can create this, uh, these spaces and we can invite the interested people to engage with us in a different way. And, but I'm, I don't know what is going to emerge from that. I, I have no idea. I'm not optimistic, but I'm not pessimistic either. No, this is good. This is just a, I, kind of a discomfort of not knowing is, is okay. Um, I think, um, Wambu, you might have something to add, but Angela, I also see your hand up. Angela, if you want to share something. Wambu, go ahead. I'll follow you. Oh, no, uh, I was just going to say I was fascinated by the idea of um, hierarchies, even in these new spaces. And... Um, but I find it interesting because I think the idea of moving away from what has been is changing the thinking. I, I think even in our research collective, we deliberately kind of went in saying, you know, we, we do not come here as, you know, some are already doctors, academic doctors, some are in the making. We are just, you know, Angela and Wambui and, you know, all the other members. And I, I remember at one point, someone, a, a professor was being invited into the group and it was very interesting for most of us in our setting, uh, referring to this individual as professor is the norm. And so it took Angela who does not belong, <laughs> so to speak to you know, this um, cultural setting to use the first name of the professor. And in that actually that chased away that person because I think that person was coming in to fit into a particular hierarchy. And so I think when you are in a situation where you deliberately refuse to, um, to en uh, what is this, to encourage the hierarchies to, and, and to understand that it is peer to peer, that is what is different. Whether you've been in this you know, space for 10 years or two years or two months, that peer to peer business, be it at generational level, years of experience, you come as I think that is such an kind of this notion of creating. Oh, pardon me, Professor. I think that your sound is um, shooting in and out a little bit. I was just going. Oh, I think I'm so sorry. I don't know. Can you hear me now? A little bit. Um, there's some buzzing on the on the mic. I'm afraid. Okay, I'll see what's going on. Okay. 
I think just to build on what Wombu was saying, but I respectfully, <laughs> I, I respectfully said within our group, we had already kind of come to an agreement and had a discussion that, you know, it was intentional that we were using each other's first names and so forth. So, um, but I de definitely played the, oh, well, this is what we do within our, our small, this is the culture that we have established within our small research collective, which in some ways was intentionally counter culture to what academic culture um, in the Kenyan context um, is often um, like, which is quite hierarchical. Um, but the point I wanted to also build on what Leandro had said around, um, I think earlier about decentralization. Um, in my own work, I think one of the things that I've, I've come to learn is that until we actually turn our attention to the infrastructural level, you know, conversations around decolonial knowledge and so forth will just be turning in circles because we need to actually pay attention to the scholarly infrastructure on which even such decolonial knowledge sits on. Um, and so I think for me personally, um, really noticing the growing commercialization of scholarly communications. Um, you know, there's, there's a growing body of work for those who perhaps are not as, as aware, we can throw in some of the links, um, talking about this, uh, you know, the big five, the growing power of the oligopoly of academic publishers, especially in the digital, in the digital times, right? So some, some of the statistics like 70% um, of papers published in the social sciences are published by the top five publishers. And so I think until we pay attention um, to some of these, uh, you know, geopolitics, because most of these are, are all headquartered in Euro-America um, and, and the kind of uh, commercial um, logics that, that push forward a lot of this academic work, I think we are not going to really get at at this question of decolonial knowledge. And so for me, and I think many of the collaborators on this call and, and elsewhere, you know, you can't have decolonial knowledge until you actually think about decentralizing infrastructure. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there, but that's part of the motivation for me. That's my slice and why I continue to work on, on things like the kind of open source platforms, um, you know, fully recognizing that we can't just have techno solutionism, but going back to the idea of a placeholder holding space um, for discussion, you know, in, in a world where we are constantly, um, you know, moving about and we often don't have the space and time to just sit together and talk together about what it is, what, what is decolonial knowledge? Like, what are we reaching for? What are we trying towards? Um, and, and I think that's a very, uh, important thing to just um, work on together. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I'm glad that question incited some even more conversation because Richard, I see your hand up too. Uh, so you can go ahead. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'd like to add something to the decentralization and centralization point and uh, to what has been said until now, maybe to reiterate it. I, I think we have to live with the with the fact that centralization and decentralization are ongoing processes as colonization and decolonization are there is no beginning beginning and end to it for instance this event here was <clears throat> celebrated by the new president of the 4s as one of the activities of the 4s american society to, so to speak, decenter itself and, 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 and come into a conversation with, with people on other continents and in other countries, which certainly is, is true. And uh, in other words, it's a form of centralization. We are meeting in one Zoom meeting. We are speaking English. We are referring to a body of knowledge which goes under the name of STS. Maybe it would have never been invented on another continent. And at the same time, we are trying to integrate other forms of knowing. And therefore, I found it quite, quite uh, important that some of the speakers says, well, actually, I, I don't relate to this decolonization or post-colonial STS. It's about indigenous STS. And, and so if, if we open this box, then it is a permanent process of how much centralized or unified vocabulary do we need and how much decentralization do we need in order to actually have interesting forms of difference other than a uniform discourse 
and and I, th I think to to continue the point which I tried to make at the beginning and then then I I stopped because as I was getting too long I said that the, these two aspects that the techno sciences are in and of themselves a colonizing process because it is about science is about knowing better to do something and technology is about doing more effectively and and so if if this travels into other spaces it is colonizing these spaces it's changing them and then this also means colonization in the everyday meaning uh, of the word, namely Europe ha having colonized the rest of the world. And I said, these two processes are, are closely linked to each other and can only be resolved together. And, and I think for that, there are three reasons. And, and the one is, the, if I may say so for a lack of a better word, the engines of techno-scientific capitalism have multiplied and are in place around the globe. I think this notion of the global north is actually distracting from the fact that they are everywhere and of course more powerfully now in, in China and in India and in Japan and in North America. And 500 years ago, it was only in Europe, but they are also in, in Johannesburg and in Buenos Aires and, and, and so on. So one cannot point the finger at one place so digitization is not done in Silicon Valley only. It's done together around the globe. The, the, the second point is um, the pre-colonial archives and resources, be they from outside of Europe or from Europe, which also has pre-colonial archives and resources, are by now, after those 500 years of colonization, accessible only to a certain limit much of it has actually been destroyed it's gone and and this is where indigenous uh, uh, knowledge becomes important as a, as a form of inspiration but even if if parts of it are are somehow survived in archives and and, and in other forms of of, of uh, uh, transmitted knowledge they they do not immediately offer solutions for our contemporary uh, problems because our contemporary problems are the results of 500 years of colonization so they need new solutions and and therefore my third point is and and this is then back to centralization and decentralization my third point is that the, the current moment we are living in is is largely defined by the prognosticated collapse of our planet's biosphere and now this very diagnosis or this prognosis is, is techno-scientific knowledge. Otherwise, we wouldn't know it. We know it through techno-sciences. But at the same time, it is caused by this unholy alliance between capitalism and techno-sciences. Industrialization has destroyed the, the, bio, uh, the biosphere. So we... It is the cause of it, but it is also the, the prognosis of it. So we depend on it. And, and, and human, any human attempts to avert this, this collapse of the biosphere can only have a chance if it is followed through by the entire humanity around the globe. And this again requires a, a joint understanding of what it is about. And this requires a, a common language a common code and, and and this asks for a specific form of centralization and the the crux of the matter is that this centralization must be a better one a smarter one 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 which is about how to live in harmony with with the with the earth in other words the the techno sciences as we know them they rather destroyed the earth we have to improve the techno sciences but you cannot replace them because we have nothing better so in my view, decolonial techno science is about finding a better science rather than replacing it with something from the past. It is about the future. It's, it's about making a better future. And for that, we have no solid ground, especially none from the past. We have inspirations. And so here, this, this play from this, this sort of uh, dialectics between centralizing and decentralizing is, is, is part of a decolonial practice. And, uh, and I mean, I mean, 
in exchange with Leandro about this and the publication about it, and I'm working hard on meeting the deadline. <laughs> so I'm, I'm speaking out of that. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, um, I also want to acknowledge too, there's a lot of activity going on in the chat. So, you know, folks, feel free to kind of keep that going too. I appreciate it. A lot of discussion on sort of this global south, global north terminology that I think it's thrown around a lot um, um, in academia, um, in the NGO world, to definitions around decoloniality, decolonization, and even the possibilities of that. Um, and thanks folks for also sharing literature that hopefully becomes useful to some of you all in the audience too. I just wanna keep some space open before I hand it to Jamie to ask the next, next question. Does anyone have a response or anything else to share before we move on? I, I, may, may I? Um, it's just a question for, for all of us. I mean, uh, in academia, we are used to deal with concepts in a more accurate, I mean, in the most accurate way possible. You know, we are taught uh, during graduate studies, especially, that we have to define the concept, we have to operationalize the concept, we have to. Uh, I'm not sure that that's good here for this project. I think that uh, sometimes we are we are very efficient in create fractures, in create differences that at the end of the day may explain why five publishers are publishing 70% of everything published in the social sciences, for example. Because uh, for me, it's pretty clear that, uh, I mean, it's clear that it's not clear if we are talking about the same, but it's clear against what kind of phenomena we are fighting um, and I, or, or, or actors sometimes. So my question is, do we need these precise definitions or we need a political program in which we feel like we belong to the program? If I if I am allowed, I can and can pick this up and react to it. Yes. Uh, go ahead, Richard. Uh, thanks, Leandro, for, the, for this intervention. I I, I share the, your your entry point. Um, a lot of consensus can can be achieved and agreement can be achieved for a purpose at hand, without. Uh, a lot of investment into, so to speak, the precise definition of what is the situation where we are, who are we, where do we want to go, and what are the methods by which we want to go there. This may uh, hinder a meaningful cooperation in many situations. But, but I think the, the limit is when it is about agreeing over a distance, agreeing around the globe, convincing people from various continents what is now important. And I, I think that that's the, the point when these, these definitions, this, this language, this codification of the problem uh, becomes important. And, and so I think it is governance over a distance. Uh, as as opposed to sort of human interaction, where it, yeah, you are you, we we here as we are here, we we can agree on something without fighting over the right words. But if we want to convince those who are not here, especially if we want to deliver a paper to a parliament who has to take a decision which affects other people's lives, they will ask for the evidence, and then and then we are back to square one. What what is what are our methods of of uh, producing evidence, and and then we we need to agree on that. And and here is where the centralizing and decentralizing mechanisms I I, I think works. Thanks, Richard. I'm going to hand it over now to Jamie. Um, go ahead, Jamie. 
Um, so I just want to again highlight that there's a lot um, happening in the chat, um, and I wanted to make sure that we have space um, to address some of that. So perhaps we could give space for um, Dr. Talbear to respond. Um, and I'd also really love to hear from Jess, Dugu, and Wambly about initiatives that you've been a part of that you feel are helpful, as well as those that maybe haven't been so helpful. So kind of grounding this in what, what has been a, tried and what, what's kind of been helpful and what hasn't. Um, but I want to make sure that that everyone has a space to respond to the previous dialogue as well. So um, perhaps, Kim, would you like to uh, start us off? Sorry, I was getting up a cup of tea. What? What do you want me to respond to? Um, well, I wanted to give space if you wanted to uh, share what you shared in the chat. And then also this uh, question of sort of what initiatives have been helpful <clears throat> and what initiatives haven't been helpful. Uh, I said what I had to say in the chat, so I'm not really interested in, I mean, come on, <laughs> it would take a whole semester of work. So the initiatives that have been helpful or not helpful, helpful in which regard? Oh, towards decolonial praxis or STS? Yes, and if, you know, if different language yeah. works better, I feel like part of what we've been excavating here is that perhaps decolonial isn't the right terminology. Uh, I mean, Jessica Kolopenik can probably say uh, in a more detailed way um, why that's not the right terminology for us. I mean, I certainly use talk about, there's a talk I give called Decolonization of Science and Technology, which I... Um, site. So for people that are interested, uh, maybe somebody else can put it in the chat. There's an article I use called Indigenization is Inclusion, Reconciliation and Decolonization, Navigating the Different Visions for Indigenizing the Canadian Academy. It's by Adam Godry and Danielle Lorenz. So I use the definitions. I talk about how inclusion is not reconciliation, is not decolonization. And they're using some uh, I think their citations are fairly global, but I'd have to go back and look in terms of thinking about the way that those words move and work in different parts of the world. And what they're really trying to do is explain how these are not the same thing and they tend to get conflated within the Canadian Academy. And given that I go between Canada and the US, I can say that there's a lot of overlap with the, the use of the terms in the US. And so um, I do use decolonization in reference to that uh, idea that we're not do simply doing an inclusion into the settler state worldview, right? Even though we're operating within settler state structures. Um, and so I do, uh, this is why what Jessica Kolopanik was getting at, our work, and I said this in the chat earlier because I'm, I was formerly a planner and I'm the daughter of an Indigenous planner. I grew up in both urban and reservation Indigenous communities and lands now occupied by the U.S. So so there's a sense in which um, I have always been very concerned and was raised to be concerned with what we might today call repatriating land and life to indigenous peoples. But these communities have been doing this for a while, right? Since the mid 20th century. And in, of course not in the US because a lot of our decolonial and anti-racist work in the US is inspired by what's going on in decolonization projects globally, right? So I do use the word, but I use it with a caveat, I guess. And so in terms of, um, initiatives that have been helpful. Yeah, no, I think I'll leave it at that because I didn't have, uh, yeah, I don't know if maybe Jessica wants to add to anything I said. Thank you, Kim. Jessica, yeah, would you Sure, yeah, I will jump in. Um, I mean, uh, as critical Indigenous studies scholars, we, um, we use sort of problematic language all the time because we have to, right? Like we have to, in, when we're engaging with particular institutional um, struggles and, and things like that, we, we have to, to sort of uh, be very strategic about the terms we use. But I think also the, the project of Indigenous STS for me is also about interrogating um, the concepts that seek to sort of describe all that is good, 
like justice and ethics and decolonialism, because these concepts have also been shaped by colonial thinking, that is logics of whiteness and patriarchy. So um, sure, in moments we use strategically decolonization or inclusion even at times or reconciliation, things like this, but really at the heart, at the core of our work uh, at Indigenous STS at the U of A is relationality. Um, we're drawing on our own indigenous embodied knowledges, our relations with our with our spaces, with our peoples, with our relatives, human and non-human. Um, we we center indigenous governance and sovereignty at the heart of what we do. And we're really all about lifting those anchored lines around what is thought of as Western and indigenous, because we uh, as indigenous scholars, we embody, like we aren't half and half of these things and we are here in the present. Um, I know Kim uh, Kim's comment, I wanted to echo that because it's really important that in conversations around decolonial praxis, we're not situated in indigenous peoples historically and our knowledge is as, as uh, sort of no longer sort of valid and, and these kinds of things, which, which was mentioned earlier. So um, that, that's a little bit about, about what I think. Thanks, Jessica. Wanwee, did you wanna um, share your thoughts on what's been helpful or not helpful in this work? Um, I could, and I really hope my sound will behave itself this time around. But I, I just want to say my head, it's, it has been exploding in the last half hour or so, because like I said, I come from media studies. So to enter you know, the space of um, STS, as a formal discipline and to hear about um, the terms, the constructs and what they mean and how even the comment that was made earlier about you know, definitions and so on um, has been very interesting. Um, but one thing that has kind of jumped out at me in, in this um, whole conversation to this point is the idea of the um, scholar as a part of the community. And so in the case of Kim uh, talking about repatriation of lands, and she is a scholar and she has studied this and she is contributing to this sense of who a people are and what belongs to them. That this is connected to being uh, a scholar, that, that the people's life and what they do and their well being, this is connected to who she is because she's part of them. And a big part of what I see in my own context is that um, the idea of knowledge and scholarship has been separated from normal day-to-day -day life. So, you know, we do research in the academies, the true picture of the ivory tower, but the, it's not the academic me as one boy coming in and talking to my fellow citizens, one who is a plumber, one who is a carpenter, one who is something else. And in all that we do, we are contributing to making our society better. So I think I am I'm really struck by that notion of um, contribution, of wholeness, of oneness, that uh, the, the scholar, the plumber the, is not an individual, they're part of a collective and each one contributes to that collective. Um, that said, uh, I would say that in our system, since we have a very highly regulated education system and it's, it's very narrow, I would say, you know, we do doctoral studies in a particular way, postgraduate studies in a particular way and so on. So the research, the scholarship, the thinking becomes constrained. And my view is that part of what I can do is work in a way that is not constraining, even for the students that I work with, even for those that I interact with. And, and this may sound very, you know, airy fairy, it's not concrete, but sometimes um, depending on the context that you're in, the battle that you fight is not even tangible. It is philosophical. It is about being, it is about, it's about identity and you cannot, you know, sort that out, you know, at systemic level, or at least you eat away at the system slowly, <laughs> if, if that is making any sense. But if I can put it in concrete terms, 
that my contribution or my sense of initiative is the way I work with my students, the way we, 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 we encourage um, certain things. I can't think of anything more tangible to say right now because we do not have actual formal um, big networks. But uh, let me take that back. We have colleagues, uh, like in our collective actually, we have two colleagues who participate in um, a research uh, group that works with postgraduate students and helps them work and build their, um, their, their studies in a particular way. So the idea is equality, freedom of expression, freedom of thinking through your ideas away from this highly regulated structure. I don't know if that makes any sense. That's what I'd say for now. Makes plenty of sense, makes plenty of sense. Thank you, Wanlui. Uh, I'm gonna ask the last prepared question and then we're gonna open it up to the questions that have been collected um, in the chat function. Sorry if we don't get through all of the audience Q&A, these are pretty um, heavy questions, big ones, and they're really important. So we'll try to move through them. But for your last prepared question, you know, because this is a panel that's really dedicated to graduate students, um, kind of students again, who are working through STS, um, do you all, you know, have just one piece of advice for junior colleagues who are from our communities, uh, maybe from our institutions, who are interested in rethinking or destabilizing the way STS has been typically carried out? Maybe just one piece of advice, and I can keep this open. And this is for everyone, um, if anyone wants to jump in. Perhaps we could start with Dugu. I think Dugu didn't have a chance to um, answer that last question about what's been helpful and what's been not helpful. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, I think I am not the um, this person giving the advice. I do not. I don't know. I cannot do that, and I don't have some magic, you know, sentences to say something. I think people just discover this in their own journey and in collaboration and in such um, spaces. So I may not answer to your question, Kat, but I may say something about that we discussed in relation to holding a space or infrastructures, you know. Um, so when I think about the ways to do SDS in such a political, you know, context, I recall myself because I got my training in Toronto and there as an SDS scholar, I have been thinking in different ways. But after I moved to Turkey, the way I asked questions, my matter of concerns have also changed largely. So uh, this may also speak to Jessica's you know, point about the embodied knowledge. I think we should all be you know, attending to what it means more when we are even talking at this transnational uh, spaces. So um, for the helpful in initiatives, um, I just think that, you know, we all also talk about the experimenting with new, you know, methods or new knowledges, etc. So I may just underline these experiments may also come out of some necessity, you know, as the spaces uh, like as, for example, the universal space, spaces in Turkey are not for critical thinking anymore uh, in a way. So this, out of this necessity, for example, as Istanbul Lab, we orient ourselves to the arts and culture centers, you know, to continue doing critical knowledge production, et cetera. So uh, the, maybe, you know, the nature of these uh, spaces may also be important. So it asks for what would be the, you know, hybrid knowledge spaces that we can create constantly and how we can actually infrastructure uh, this back to the universities because I'm still an old school, maybe a scholar, uh, like try to continue reimagining universities otherwise and holding them as, you know, institutions to do critical knowledge production over there. Uh, I find this space is still so important and uh, believe in the corridor talks and you know importance of all these things and this maybe also speaks to the pandemic reference that we referred shortly previously so in the COVID time for example the way we worked as um, here colleagues interesting you know critical 
social studies, of science and technology. Uh, this really affected us largely. We couldn't um, translate our work directly into a digital space because we realized that this, you know, friendship, community, bringing that, coming together, this has been a really important part of the, our work. So when we, you know, as a space scholars, we all know that uh, science production is also an effective process, you know, but we may also as SDS scholars um, may skip this point when we reflect on our own practices and the way they build these spaces. So uh, I also want to bring this effective side of the, you know, knowledge production processes on the table as well. So I think that's all I can say for now. Thanks. Thank you, Dugu. Um, I'll open it up again for that last question. If anyone wants to share any insight for any of the students in the audience, um, folks kind of making their way through this field, and then we'll go into the um, audience Q&A. Yeah, go ahead, Angela. I think the original framing was for advice for junior colleagues, but I'm going to give advice for senior colleagues. Um, as a junior colleague myself, I think it's important that you know, whoever has power advocates um, to the university and to other structures to invest in public, non-commercial scholarly infrastructure and to recognize the work and labor that goes into it. That is often done by junior colleagues, volunteers, and people who care but don't get recognized for that. And I think um, we really need to turn this into an area of attention um, if we really care about all of the ethical and philosophical issues that were covered on the panel today. Um, so I hope that that the senior scholars who have um, a track record and so forth can, can help to further open up space, dialogue and credentialing of this kind of often invisibilized work. Um, I'll jump in because that's also really, uh, thank you, Angela. Um, Personally, I'm abandoning traditional academic outputs. Not only are they boring, but also to set a kind of uh, help forge roads that will others can, because I'm in a place of tremendous privilege. I acknowledge that, right? In terms of my academic career, I've been able to go wherever I want, and that's very rare. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate that that reminder. Um, and also opening up tenure criteria, right? The old school tenure criteria need to die because that is not a good impact factor, what they're measuring, right? It's not. I've seen too many good colleagues not get tenure for bullshit reasons, like they're not publishing in some dusty old journal with a paywall. Um, the, the other, the, so the advice I have is not necessarily restricted to STS, given that I said I'm, I'm a former planner, I'm the daughter of a planner, I was raised in the community and, and uh, pan-native activism of the American Indian movement. I was born in 1968. To me, academia has been one among many tools. And the students I'm interested in cultivating and attracting are those who understand that this is a tool and don't put all your eggs in this basket. It's not a lifestyle. That is a regrettable choice if you make it. Um, there and, and to scale down a bit, both anthropology and STS have provided me really incisive frameworks and methods to do the work I want to do on behalf of uh, indigenous communities and thought and our worlds. But that's why I'm here. I'm, I mean, and it's a delicate balance, right? Because you have to do the work to make this place tolerable, but also remembering that this is my tool. This is not my place or my home. And that's a delicate balance to walk for those of us that are connected to place and connected to community. And um, it's it's an interesting challenge, but um, that's so that's my advice. Always remember that and keep that in. This is not who you are. This is a tool to get something done on behalf of your, your, your social justice, sorry, just causes, because I don't have a better word yet. Thanks. I just wanted to point out, Professor Talbert, that while you were speaking, the emojis were going wild with a lot of support about that message. Thank you. Um, I would like to, um, to say a little bit about um, that when I was a uh, bachelor student in political science in Argentina, we spent all our classes discussing theory from abroad and trying to connect that to the local reality, and it never worked. So uh, it was two hours of discussion about what Robert Dahl actually knew about Peronism or what uh, connection there is between the parliamentary system and the clientelist system in politics, local politics. So it took me 20 years 
after that and a lot of people who have helped me to launch a journal to create a space for people to think differently and to reflect about their own conditions of knowledge production so my my, my piece of advice for for everyone but especially for scholars in the periphery is not to wait until the right journal the right program the right project initiative appear you have to engage you have to take risk uh, is related to what Professor Tolbert thought about using academia, using your academic capital, if you want, to create a different thing that may affect people at a different level. Uh, so I think that especially for junior, because they have that energy, but it's also for senior, because they have that power and they have that uh, possibilities sometimes. So that, that would be my advice. If I may say something. Please. Um, I, I just want to pick up on what has been said that um, it takes a lot of effort, even bringing us together tonight. And we, we speak so differently. We think so differently. We don't necessarily agree, but that is what is interesting. Um, and sometimes we need to work hard to understand one another. What, what is the other saying? What, what does the other mean? But that is where the work is. Um, I think for a long time, particularly in my context, I've seen that we are put in boxes, that you, you should kind of follow this, you know, stay here. And to get out becomes, um, it's untidy, it's problematic, but that's where what is most interesting is uh, things happen. So I, I think this idea of including more voices and deliberately participating um, in new situations. And I really appreciate even the collective that we're in with Angela and other colleagues, that we come from different backgrounds. Most of us are East Africans, but even our disciplines, we come from different disciplines, but the wealth of discussion and thinking um, is worth it. So I think the work is worth it, is, is what I would say to each one of us. Thank you. Right on. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'm going to leave. There's no one else. I'm kind of going to put up a hand. I think we have time for like two questions. I'm sorry. Oh, I think uh, Jessica has a hand. Oh, oh, sweet. All right. Yes. Jessica. Yeah, sorry. I was a little late to the game there. Um, so me and Kim spent a lot of time training and supporting Indigenous students. So for this question, I was really thinking about non-Indigenous students, um, non-Indigenous uh, people more generally. We're often asked uh, in Canada uh, and in the U.S. by white settlers, um, what can we do to help, you know, and that, that sort of a thing. So for non-Indigenous folks here uh, that are interested in decolonial STS. Um, I draw inspiration from the question that uh, Professor Aileen Morton Robinson from uh, Australia asks, and she says, how far are you willing to go? Um, and because for us as Indigenous peoples, there's so much at stake, our, our entire like existence as, as peoples, right? So um, are you willing to stick your neck out? Are you willing to get the hate mail and the hate emails and, and all these kinds of things? Are you willing to to um, get professional blowback. Um, so my advice is don't like be bad. Don't do what is uh, conventionally ex uh, expected of you, but do what's needed uh, because that's what we're doing. Um, and I'll leave it there. Great, thank you so much. Um, whew, you know, so Baker, you did a wonderful job collecting all of the questions. Um, I'm, I'm gonna you know, save these questions and I'll share them with the panelists. And it's not to say that the panelists that you need to you know, respond to these questions on your own time after this, but I just wanna share them just as the show of the inspiration of the kinds of things that were really bubbling up during this conversation today. Um, one conversation did, or one question did come up um, and that's on the more than human. And so I, I just wanna make space for that. Um, and the person writes, um, I would like to ask about space for the more than human, other than human relationalities, ways of knowing and world making within STS, epistemological investigations. Many indigenous knowledge systems treat the more than human world in completely different terms from Western enlightenment colonial rationalities. 
How can we expand modes of intersectionality beyond the human, both in knowledge making and reconfiguring our relationships to the natural world? Keep that open. Oh, I'm sorry, are you asking for responses to that one? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I think, so I've been asked to keynote a genocide in the Americas conference next year. If it happens, uh, it's been canceled twice because of COVID. You can't talk about indigenous genocide in the Americas without talking about the genocide again, if you will, and you can look at the UN definition of that. If, if you consider more than the more than human to have persons and societies, which indigenous peoples do as far as I've ever experienced, our elimination is entangled on these continents, right? You, you can't speak about the elimination of, say, Cree or Dakota people without talking about the elimination of our non-human relatives that, that co that, with whom we were co-sustained and co-constituted. An STS framework that has been very helpful to me by the way, co-production. So um, th this is this, I, I don't, I can't speak for the rest of STS, it, but, but for indigenous STS and for the kind of decolonial work that we're doing, our fates are very much entangled. And this is why indigenous knowledge, which is any knowledge that helps indigenous people survive as people's capital P, not simply traditional knowledge, right? We're dismantling all of these binaries in our work that have been laid on us by the colonizer. This is why it's so important. And indigenous knowledge is produced as we continue to exist in intimate relation with our places. And this gets at another question. It's not about time and linearity, it's about place. And it's about this, and I'll use a cliche, but this web of relations, right? It's about ongoing relation. One does not have to be indigenous, quote unquote, to come into good relation. This can also involve the production of, of knowledge, right? As as peoples and persons continue to live and interact with one another, there is knowledge being produced. So, so it's incredibly important. Um, I'll stop because I could just go on and on and then I'll start to look like an evangelist for indigenous uh, STS, so <laughs> Thank you. Uh, did anyone else wanna take on that question? All right, so I'll go ahead and I think we do have time for one more. Um, so I just want to, this pimping question came up pretty early, perhaps building on critical indigenous studies, what kinds of analytic lenses or methodological tools do you use or would you prescribe for analyzing white supremacy and settler colonialism in science? As an ethnographer of biomedicine, I sometimes struggle to show how experimental work is colonial when there are, aren't direct interactions with indigenous communities even though I feel in my gut that their pursuits are motivated by neo-colonial ways of thinking about life and body. Um, and I do wanna keep this question pretty broad, even though you know, it can seem directed to, to part of the panel um, who are already working um, in critical indigenous studies. Well, I draw on uh, the definition of critical Indigenous studies from uh, a really uh, brilliant edited volume uh, edited by Morton Robinson, and she uh, defines she distinguishes Indigenous studies from critical Indigenous studies by the the, the kind of simple fact that um, critical Indigenous studies is done by Indigenous people. Um, indigenous studies is done by all kinds of folks, but critical Indigenous studies can only be produced by Indigenous scholars. Non-Indigenous folks can engage with our analytics, but they can't produce them themselves. So um, there, there's su such a rich literature to analyze, especially the role of whiteness in colonialism um, in, in, in critical Indigenous studies. And so I would recommend just, just looking to that literature. Great. Oh gosh. So we only have two minutes left, a little less than two. Um, I'm going to have to start wrapping up this panel. Um, but I do want to, you know, thank everyone for their participation in the chat. Um, and, and really, oh, see, I see someone, um, Sandra Gonzalez, I think you've asked if um, a point could be expanded. I'm not too sure if you're referring to um, Dr. Kalapenik's point. 
Um, I hope that, you know, maybe we can kind of exchange information to see. Oh, thank you. Yeah, for clarifying that. Um, Jessica, would you mind talking a little bit about more about what you just brought up? I think uh, just for expanding on that. I guess uh, uh, I wonder sort of what what's unclear uh, about it. I mean, critical Indigenous studies, uh, as I understand it, is is about um, centering our, our Indigenous ontologies and epistemologies, but then methodologically using whichever tools uh, help us get the job done. And so it's it's not as much about sort of creating this uh, disciplinary canon, uh, although we are sort of required to do that to continue existing in uh, in the academic institution. Um, but but maybe uh, yeah, I'm not sure what was unclear around. Perhaps the critical indigenous studies is done by indigenous scholars, and not by uh, not indigenous folks who can certainly engage with our ideas. Um, and and perhaps even apply our analytics, but um, cannot produce it because they don't have the the, the embodied um, knowledges that that we do as Indigenous peoples. Great, thank you again for for just kind of expanding on that, Jessica, and taking the time to do that. Wow. All right. So we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, you know, thank you so much to everyone who's who stayed for the conversation, to all of the panelists. Thank you for sharing your insight. This was great. Um, you know, a recording of this conversation is going to be put onto YouTube through the STS Futures Initiative page. It's going to be closed captioned. Um, and, you know, we hope that you can share the conversation with other folks who just might be interested in this topic, who might want to detangle um, the buzzwords that really kind of go through academic mainstream and really allow us to kind of think more critically about how we're going to pursue our own work um, in the ways that we feel is most, as most ethical and socially just as possible. Um, and so, Jamie, I just want to hand it off to you for any last words and goodbyes, um, and then we're going to call it. I just want to say thank you again to our panelists. It has been just such an honor to be here and to hear your thoughts. Um, so I really want to say thank you again. Um, we really, really enjoyed having you. And I think I can echo so much of what was in the chat and what was said out loud. This has just given me so much to think about and I really appreciate that. So thank you all. Um, and thank you for our audience also for all your contributions. <laughs>